Good morning, Bimblers. And you join me halfway up Frodsham Hill. We've got some unfinished business here in Frodsham. So we've come back for Frodsham too. I'm halfway up the hill. I may as well get right up to the top. So let's stop messing about. And let's bimble. And so we reach the summit, Bimblers. Frodsham Hill, aka Overton Hill. 152 metres tall. That's 500 foot for people who still work in imperial measurements. Not exactly Everest, but quite the feat if you're up four times a night feeding a baby. It started out its life as a large sand dune at the side of a salty sea in a desert by the equator. That was way back before the T-Rex and the Brontosaurus, back in the Triassic era. That's roughly 200 million years ago. And in those 200 million years, the tectonic plate shifted. And it moved from the equator to Cheshire. It all formed the Mersey Valley. And that's why we have so much sandstone in this region. That's why all our churches are built out of it and our war memorials, including the one up here on Frodsham Hill. As a Brucey bonus, that salty sea to the side of the sand dunes, that all evaporated off, and the sand and the salt mixed together, and they formed rock salt. And that's why so much rock salt comes out of Northwich and places like that. And they come down the River Weaver, past Frodsham, into the River Mersey. That salt is why the Romans liked Chester so much, and it's why all the chemical industries built up around the Mersey, in Runcorn and Widnes and Warrington, and here in Frodsham. Frodsham Hill used to be home to an Iron Age castle, but a bit closer in history. It was home to an anti-aircraft operations room. That was in the 1950s, at the height of the Cold War. However, it turned out we didn't need to be worried about planes, because the Russians developed rockets and missiles, just like the Americans did, with our help. So they changed it to a civil defence training centre. And then in the 1980s, it became the Cheshire County Emergency Standby Centre. If you want to know how that would have worked, you need to watch that film, Threads. But we need to battle our way down this giant sand dune and have a look at something else made out of sandstone and talk about some people that also came from the equator. That's Bimbo.
And so we reach St. Lawrence's Church, a classic piece of church design, built out of sand from a Triassic era desert that used to be on the equator, which somehow found its way to Frodsham. The original parts of the church date back to 1180, and the chancel, that's the bit where the choir sings, that goes back to the 1300s. The North Chapel goes back to the 1500s. But just like all these old churches, it was tarted up a bit in the Victorian era. And that was done by a Bodley and Garner between 1880 and 1883. Bodley and Garner were both articled to Sir George Gilbert Scott. Articled means understudy of or assistant to. George Bodley was actually a family friend of Sir George Gilbert Scott. And when Sir Giles Gilbert Scott, that's Sir George Gilbert Scott's grandson, was tasked with building the Anglican Cathedral in Liverpool, George Bodley actually overseen what he was doing. That was because Sir Giles Gilbert Scott was only 22, and the cathedral was actually his first project. Imagine that. It's absolutely massive. You can see it from the top of Frodsham Mill. One curious piece of history at St Lawrence's Church is one of the graves. And it has an interesting parallel with our last bimble to Frodsham. In our last bimble to Frodsham, we visited St Peter's Church in Aston. And it's home to a grave of a Chloe Gambia. And as her name would suggest, she was born in Gambia in 1760. When she was seven years old, she was sold into slavery, brought over to Liverpool. And she was bought by the Aston family. No one's quite sure why they bought Chloe. She wasn't going to be much use around the house. She was only seven years old. And she certainly wasn't going to be much use on the farm. But she spent 70 years with the Aston family. She became their housekeeper. And at 70 years old, she died of breast cancer. That was in 1838. And they had Chloe buried next to the family at St Peter's Church in Aston. A grave here at St Lawrence's Church is separated by only 44 years. And that's to a Prince Waribo. He was the son of an African king, King Jar Jar. He would have come from Africa, from the same location that Chloe Gambia did. That would be Bonnie in Nigeria. Only Chloe Gambia was sold as a slave. And Prince Waribo was the son of a king. How did he end up here in Frodsham? Let's bimble and find out. Prince Waribo was brought here to Frodsham to go to school. He went to Manor House School, which was a boarding school for boys. It's now a Chinese restaurant, which is up for sale if you fancy buying it. He was sent here by his father, King Jar Jar of Apobo. And the story of King Jar Jar is very interesting. He didn't come from a royal lineage, like you would think. He was a blacksmith's son from Nigeria. And when he was very young, he was kidnapped and sold into the slave trade. He wasn't kidnapped by white Europeans, he was kidnapped by other Africans, you see. The slave trade started out with prisoners of war, really. Indentured servants or indentured labourers. You see, all the different regions in Africa used to have wars with each other, all the different villages, all the different tribes. And whoever won, 
got to keep all the soldiers and all the villagers and sell them off into slavery us white Europeans used to buy the slaves from the Africans and it was us that decided they weren't indentured servants or labourers but they were property and we owned them that was because of some verses in the Bible I've got a few written down in the big book of Bimble slaves be obedient to your human masters with fear and trembling that kind of insinuates that slaves weren't humans another one slaves be subject to your masters with all reverence not only to those who are good but also to those who are perverse very grim and macabre not all those Africans that were enslaved were sold to white Europeans though the people of Nigeria used to keep slaves as well in the port of Bonny which is where Chloe Gambia would have come from and where Prince Waribo would have sailed from they used to use the slaves in the port to shift stuff about and do work they didn't want to do themselves the difference between the Nigerian slave owners and us white Europeans the Nigerian slave owners used to let the slaves work themselves out of slavery or buy their way out of slavery which is what King Jar Jar did he worked his way up by being very clever and an astute businessman the business that they were in was palm oil he was so clever that he eventually struck out on his own and was freed from his slavery and set up his own kingdom of a pobo of which he made himself the king well you just would wouldn't you if you're going to start up a kingdom you're going to make yourself the king aren't you it was all that trading in palm oil that would have made King Jar Jar aware of Frodsham you see the Mersey Valley they used to use a lot of palm oil for all the chemical industries mostly for making soap a palm oil trader by the name of Walter Johnston actually brought Prince Waribo over to here in Frodsham he probably would have told King Jar Jar about Manor House School Waribo became quite the local character and was much beloved by the people of Frodsham by all accounts behind these metal gates is Frodsham Cricket Grounds and this is where Prince Waribo would have met his untimely demise he came here to play cricket with his schoolmates and he fell ill the doctors said he had inflammation of the lungs unfortunately he died and he was buried at St Lawrence's Church in the same way that Chloe Gambia was buried at St Peter's Church in Aston just under different circumstances he was loved so much by the locals that apparently they shut most of the shops on the day of his funeral a few years ago one of his descendants came over from Africa to visit his grave anyway that's enough about ships coming from Africa what about ships going up and down the Manchester Ship Canal we have unfinished business let's bimble
well Bimblers, I finally get to meet him, the Daniel Adamson. In our original Bimble to Frodsham, we were supposed to meet him then, but he wasn't in. Apparently he was being fixed in Birkenhead. So I told you, we'd come for Frodsham too, and that's what we've done today. Anyway, here's my spiel about the Daniel Adamson. Daniel Adamson was born in County Durham. He was the son of the landlord of the Grey Horse pub and he was the 13th of 15 children. No telly back then, you see. When he was 31, he started his own business in Newton near Hyde. It was an ironworks and they specialised in iron boilers for ships like this and for steam trains and things like that. Most of them featured Daniel Adamson's patented anti-collapsive flange seams. But that's not why he gets a boat named after him. It's not because of his anti-collapsive flange seams. He was an early champion of the Manchester Ship Canal. In fact, the first meeting about the Manchester Ship Canal was held at his home in Didsbury. 68 influential people turned up to that meeting. Edward Leader Williams, the chief engineer of the Manchester Ship Canal, the mayor of Manchester, and all the mayors of all the towns that the Manchester Ship Canal would pass through. So the mayor of Runcorn and the mayor of Widnes and the mayor of Warrington, the mayor of Earlham and the mayor of Salford. Daniel Adamson was the chairman of the board. He was in charge of going into Parliament and arguing the case for the big ditch. And there was a lot of people against it. The railways for one. They just built all these railways and then they were going to build a massive canal that could carry more cargo than all the trains combined. That's not to mention the Port of Liverpool. It put their nose out of joint as well. They would lose business from it. Daniel Adamson sadly died in 1890, four years before the Manchester Ship Canal opened. But he got a boat named after him. But the boat wasn't built for him. It was actually built for a Ralph Brocklebank. And it was called the Ralph Brocklebank. It was built for the director of the London and North Western Railway, who was also the director of the Shropshire Union Canal. The Ralph Brocklebank was built to pull barges full of crockery from Stoke into the River Mersey. But he didn't just do that. He used to ferry passengers between Ellesmere Port and Liverpool. And during the First World War, it was a patrol vessel down the Mersey, making sure the Bosch weren't invading. In 1922, it was sold to the Manchester Ship Canal Company, and that's when it became the Daniel Adamson. It was the director's vessel, that meant that if the director of the Manchester Ship Canal wanted to get from Salford to Birkenhead, he could take his own boat. It was kind of like an aquatic Rolls Royce. I bet he had one of those as well. In 1984 it was decommissioned and it was given to the National Waterways Museum in Ellesmere Port. You know I love that. It's one of my favourite bimbles. But in more recent times, they've tarted it up a bit. They've fixed the engine and made it seaworthy again. And it goes on all kinds of nice trips. Down the Weaver Navigation up the Anderton Boat Lift. Or down the Manchester Ship Canal on a gin cruise. I'm glad I've met him. Mm-hmm.